Let's try to understand this energy eigenvalue equation for our infinite well. So the first step is, what's our potential? Now, we have a piecewise potential. The idea is that for any x below 0, it's infinity. From x equals 0 to x equals L, let's just call this v equals 0. Nice and easy. And then above x equals L, it's infinity again. So let's break this into two different cases. One is if v, and you can call this the limit as v goes to infinity, or v equals infinity in physics words. So if v equals infinity, we have that the negative, uh, negative h bar squared over 2m, second derivative with respect to um, x plus infinity, again, take a limit if that's what makes you happy, um, of our energy eigenfunction, which is the thing we're going to try to find, equals the energy of that eigenfunction and then that function itself. So here's the thing. We're taking infinity, we're multiplying it by something that has to be normalized because we have to say that our particle has a probability of 1 being found somewhere. So this can't have an infinite value. So we're saying infinity times something, and again, we don't even have to worry about this. The infinity is the problem, equals a thing. So finite, finite times an infinite. The only way that that will work is if where our, our potential is equal to infinity, our wave function is equal to zero. Because infinity times zero is zero. And if this side is zero, then the whole thing works. So what we've just learned is for the regions where the potential is infinite, in fact, we have zero probability of being found there. Now there's a physical interpretation of this, especially if you don't like my math of just plugging in infinity. Right, this is a box, and remember, that the derivative of potential energy is force, or the integral of force gives you potential energy. So your particle is in here, and then it's getting to this wall. And notice that it is the potential is literally going in this model from zero to infinity. And so over a distance of zero, we have a change in potential of infinite. So that derivative of the potential at this point is infinite. There is an infinite force. And so you might say, but quantum tunneling. No, quantum tunneling is a real thing we will learn about in a few sections. Even within quantum mechanics, you have this infinite force. And it isn't just a brief infinite force. You keep going and it's like, yeah, it, it, it just keeps being infinite. So one way of thinking about this, we call this a rigid wall. That there is no way for the particle get, to get past it. It is just impossible. So that's what this means. Okay, now what about instead if v equals zero? We'll actually solve that in a different video for the free particle. But in this case, it's just limited. And so we get that h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of our special wave functions is then that energy and those wave functions. Okay, what form did that have? Well, so we saw that, in fact, this is the same form as d squared f dx squared equals some negative, notice that negative sign, coefficient, which is a big messy thing, of f. And when does that happen? That works when f is equal to sine, square root of c, plus cosine, square root of c. So we have sines and cosines. So now, before I even go any further, and again, this c is coming from some coefficients here, this is where it can be helpful to kind of review some of the stuff that you've already learned. So if you're in quantum, you have already taken some classes that have covered some aspects of this. And even in, intro, in the intro physics book, it goes a little bit into this. When we have our first energy level in here, well, we can think about this basically like a standing wave. We're tied down at the end, it would be symmetric, and it's that. Our second energy level, well, it's like the second standing wave on a string. Tied down at the end, goes like that. I'm not necessarily doing a great job drawing these, but you hopefully get the idea. This is about when my drawing skills fail me. Should be nice and symmetric. But so you can see that at all of these, x equals zero, 
you in fact have zero. So what that means is that for this choice of coordinate system, where I'm putting x equals zero at one wall, which is a really good idea rather than putting it in the middle, for this coordinate system, we'll be using these terms. So if you redrew your coordinate system differently, uh, you'd have sines and cosines and it would be much less pleasant. So that's one way to think through what's going on. This picture is hopefully familiar to you from a previous class. In this case, we've used the differential equation to get to the result this way. So we see now that these sinusoidal functions are going to be what's satisfying our square well, and then we use more information to figure out what the square root of c is, it does relate back to these coefficients, and then what that a is. And in a separate video, I'll go through the boundary conditions and normalization.